Okay, man. Hey, Alex, how's it going? I'm good, thanks. Yourselves? I'm well. Good. Why don't you explain to the audience a little bit about yourself and your background, what you study? I am fascinated by questions of political violence, the legitimacy of political violence, as in when is it legitimate, when is it not? I'm particularly interested in uh, pacifist arguments, I suppose, and the efficacy or otherwise of non-violence, exploring these questions. And that means I'm also interested in issues around the legitimacy of the state or otherwise. And I've long been interested in, I suppose, the impact of religion in politics. And a lot of that has therefore focused around Tolstoy's political thought, because he writes about non-violence and all, all critiques of violence, critiques of the state, etc. That's what drives me. And in the process, I've also done a fair bit of work on Christian anarchism more generally, I suppose, but, but I'm particularly fascinated by Tolstoy. Your book on the Gospels as seen sort of through a Christian anarchistic lens uh, is something that fascinates us. Why should Christ be seen through an anarchistic lens? And what is the historical relationship between church and state, particularly for early Christians? I don't have a particularly pronounced Christian background, but when I came to this material and I read the gospel, it seemed to me quite obvious, along with several Christian anarchists, that an anarchistic lens is the only legitimate political translation of what Jesus preaches and exemplifies. I mean, it's what he is effectively reported to have said and how he asked, it's what he asked of his followers to do. And by that, he didn't use the word anarchism. The centerpiece of his teaching is around uh, loving your enemies, turning the other cheek, forgiving those who hurt you, etc., etc. And repeatedly so, to the point that his own example, right up to his very death, illustrates that. All that material, pretty clear then on the importance of forgiveness and nonviolence, and that is not what we do through the state. Through the state, human beings do not turn the other cheek to one another. We judge one another. We do not love our enemies. In fact, the equivalent, if you want, of the state of his day, at least Caesar, the religious and the political establishment, were complicit in crucifying Jesus. So through the state, we do not do what Jesus teaches us to do to one another. The relationship between the church and state tells a different story. Christianity was quite subversive for the first two, three centuries. A lot of early Christians did try to live up to this more radical, should we call it non-violence related essence of Jesus' teaching, to use the argument that some of the Christian anarchists were there, you know, when it became a bit too subversive, when the establishment of the time had tried every method of suppression and when that didn't work, they adopted, co-opted and modified Christianity to the empire, to their priorities. And at that point, Christianity so far removed from the rather revolutionary teaching of Jesus that it becomes a tool of the empire. It becomes the very opposite of what it was sort of supposed to represent. And so for Tolstoy in particular, the conversion of Emperor Constantine is kind of the epitome or the prime example. It doesn't mean it begins only then. It starts earlier. Tolstoy has little time for Paul, for example, but that's, that's a different debate. The adoption of Christianity as the religion of the empire by Constantine is symbolic of the perversion, the total corruption of Christianity, the flipping of its head. Now, that doesn't mean that the whole history of, if you want, churches has always been one of being subservient to the state, or that's actually too strong, but kind of working with the state and the establishment to be a religion of empire. There have been lots of radical offshoots, but by and large, most of what the institutional church has done is work with the establishment of the day in a deal that's kind of mutually beneficiary, but that tends to mute away the radical ethical teachings of Jesus. In the past, you mentioned that in the Christian anarchist perspective, the state cannot be destroyed by revolution. Why? Then how might it be destroyed? I guess to some extent it depends what you mean by revolution. Here I mean it cannot be destroyed by a non-violent revolution or by a top-down revolution. And because that is what Christian anarchists consider to be the essence of the revolutionary politics of Jesus. And so Christian anarchists like to point to a famous quote by Gustav Landau that quite a few anarchist secular as well that is like to cite it goes like this it's the state is a condition a certain relationship between human beings a mode of behavior we destroy it by contracting other relationships by behaving differently to one another 
So the core of that idea is that revolution isn't something that you impose from the outside and somehow expect compliance. It's got to come from within. It's got to come by behaving differently to one another. And then we become the new society in the shell of the old, to use another anarchist quote. So it's about changing the world, if you want, inside out and by example. That's the argument anyway, rather than through what we would typically see as a revolution, as a sort of top-down form of imposition or as a violent kind of insurrection. That's the nub of the Christian anarchist argument. And it's worth saying, it's kind of pretty central to the whole tradition of, should we call it nonviolence rather than pacifism? It's what a lot of nonviolent theory hangs on. It's the idea that the, the courageous example of some, and that, to be clear, the suffering of those who try and exemplify that different way of life, will hopefully inspire others to change their mind, for their heart to turn, and perhaps to sort of follow themselves. So it's not just the sort of a, a kind of Christian anarchist perspective, but it, it's at least in some ways quite similar to what a lot of the arguments coming out of the nonviolence tradition are about. You know, Tolstoy argued that violence is not in our nature, that it's not constitutional, that it comes from some other place, especially soldiers they're trained to. What is this other place? What is this origin? Tolstoy isn't particularly clear on the origin of violence. He sort of starts, I suppose, logically in a different way from the observation that violence is prevalent, that violence in his view happens because some people are willing to inflict it. So that's going to be the core of his logic. And if you want less violence, then we need to stop being violent to one another. He does consider a lot of, uh, should we say, the fruits of industrialization, the Industrial Revolution in particular, but of course what we might see also as the capitalism that comes with it as a source of violence. Uh, Tolstoy has a rather, should we say, romantic view of the life of, of peasant communities before the railroad arrived before that railroad took quite a few people away drawn as they were by the big lights of the city but they went into factories uh, that promoted depravity and kind of maintained them in economic slavery etc so and, and a lot of the violence that he considers uh, systemic i suppose in in modern industrial life comes with those advances of industrialization but he doesn't, to be fair, specifically say violence comes from that. I mean, if, if he ever comes close to that, it's an argument that simply says that violence happens because people are willing to be violent against one another. So there isn't a chronological origin. It's more the case that it's always been around, but we've reached a time in our evolution, I think that's not an unfair word for his thoughts, for us to kind of move away from it. And that means ditching all the institutions through which we continue to be violent against one another. Uh, if that makes sense. I, I see that it's similar to what the Marxists say, but it's different in its solution, in its formulation of the solution. So it sounds like they have a similar conception of the problem. And I want to know, where did the Marxists and Tolstoy differ? Or maybe he's more Rousseauian, but either way, the Marxists were influenced by Rousseau. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a good question. It's worth thinking about. I, I don't have an immediate answer or, or one that is necessarily kind of mature, if you want, as in matured. First thing that comes to mind is there's obviously lots of Marxist traditions. So it depends which Marxist you have in mind, and you'd have to look at that. Whereas I suppose Tolstoy is self, we're not looking at a broader tradition there. It's probably similar to what several Marxists would say, but Tolstoy has an ambivalent relationship to the notion of progress. For him, there isn't a sort of guaranteed evolution in the way that sort of scientific materialism would understand. He doesn't think that it is guaranteed, that there's something scientific and predictable about it. And he certainly doesn't think that revolutions can happen by, if you want, the great men of history, by people taking control. He, he, he seems to be hoping that it's going to bubble up again by the kind of contagious example of, of many. And the other thing, that, so Marxists, of course, emphasize, stress, I mean, their analysis is focused on the economy, the mode of, modes of production, etc. Tolstoy has things to say about that, but for him, the center of his analysis is violence and the, the enactment of violence, the repetitive enactment of violence and how that can be broken. Actually, if you really push the argument, he doesn't actually stick to that entirely himself, I think, and I, we, can, we can go into that if you want, but Tolstoy primarily calls for people not to be violent against one another, in order not, for them not to be violent, it's not in order to achieve some other gain, some other aim. Uh, he thinks that the eradication of violence, in a way, would kind of by itself, I suppose, deal with 
other economic injustices and so on. So, you know, it really all boils down to this issue of violence and how to stop it. And he has a very syllogistic and simplistic way, in a sense, of, of advocating a particular solution. I mean, the solution is quite simplistic. So and, and everything else he has to say that's unfair in the world, he ultimately boils down to the question of violence. I don't know of any Marxists that would do the same thing, even if, you know, they might, I suppose, for some steps of analysis, share a similar path, if you see what I'm saying. There's a sense that in Tolstoy's uh, The Kingdom of God is Within You, that he, when he analyzes the socialists and the brotherhood of, of scientists, he questions whether or not one can be a humanitarian in the sense that you love humanity above all else. There's, for Tolstoy, a sense that humanity is a fiction, not that people don't exist, but that when you say, when one says that they love humanity, he, he begs the question, does that include guys like alcoholics and murderers? And why wouldn't that extend to, to animals or the, the, the best or the highest of animals? When we say that we love humanity, do we really mean that what we ought to love is love our love itself or God and not something that dwells within us? There's a sense that he's much more personal in what he's focusing on and that the Christian anarchist starts with themselves before they try to fix society. In your professional opinion, do you believe that this is a proper reading of Tolstoy? I guess so. He's very concerned about alcoholics and other forms of what he might call depravity, because he sees in those people, if you want, lost human beings, people whose sense of rationality has been stifled by intoxication. For him, lots of other sensual pleasures fall in a similar category. You know, he, he, he again, to go back to that distrust of if you want the cities and the industrialized life, he dislikes them. Again, at least in significant part, because it stifles the mind and rational thinking as far as he's concerned. So I think his beef with socialists and scientific materialism of the kind that he encountered is that it doesn't focus on the most important problems. He might share a lot of their analysis, some of their concerns at least, but for him, they misdiagnose what's problematic. And it is, yes, about kind of, genuine, unconditional love, I suppose, for all human beings. And as a result of that, an inability even to inflict violence on them. Does that sort of answer your question? Absolutely, yeah. There's also, a, just to go back to Christian anarchism and why Christianity should be viewed more through an anarchistic lens, there's a passage in Romans 13 that some Christian anarchists would find troublesome. And I know you've written on this in the past, so I'd love to talk with you about it. The passage in uh, Romans 13 reads, let every soul be subject unto higher powers. This sounds very anti-anarchistic, at least at a glance, I'm curious to see what you'd say. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be or are, are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resisteth shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? It's like almost like the man, except the power. <laughs> um, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise. Of the same. That seems very much in support of a state or the powers that be. How then can one be a Christian anarchist and believe in Romans 13? Uh, I mean, that's obviously a good question, and it's an inescapable one for any Christian anarchist. There are two passages that are usually thrown back at Christian anarchists, and I should say only really those two have enough to carry with them, I suppose, to be quite significant for them to have to deal with them. It's worth just in passing, that's two out of many other passages, and Christian anarchists can point to a whole array of other passages, although it's not about counting. There are a variety of responses from different Christian anarchists, thinkers and activists, and so it's worth going through them progressively. First off, if you look towards people like Tolstoy and a few others, 
They don't comment much on this passage, in part because as far as they're concerned, that's not Jesus, it's Paul. And that's therefore not the same source, and it's therefore, and for that reason, that precise passage, as well as a few others, they distrust Paul and therefore don't want to listen to him, but focus on Jesus instead. That's kind of a cop-out, but it's not a completely legitimate one. And that's one response from a strand of Christian anarchism, should we say. I think a more interesting and enriching response, in a sense, is one that tackles, tries to engage with Romans 13 a bit further. And it goes like this. It's worth noting, first of all, that it's a letter written to the Christian community in Rome a few decades after Jesus had died. And Rome is, of course, the very center of the empire at the time. So it's it's worth noting that it's not to any Christian community across the empire. It's to the one at the very heart of the empire, which might be a reason why Paul might want to be particularly cautious in his response to that community, in, in, in that letter that he's writing to it. Now, that's the historical context or the geographical context, if you will. The textual context of this passage is even more interesting. The splitting of Paul's letters, and for that matter, much else in the Bible in two chapters, isn't something that was done by the original writers. It's something that was done by the church hierarchy by the time it had established itself when it decided to canonize those texts. What proceeds in chapter 12, before we move into chapter 13, is worth looking at because these things weren't split off and just jump straight to chapter 13 uh, when you quote that passage, as many people do. And actually, when you look at chapters 12 and 13 as a continuation, they do tend to look like a single coherent literary unit, one in which Paul is talking about love and sacrifice, about overcoming evil with good, about willingly offering oneself up for persecution. So far, very much what Jesus tends to talk about and preach in particular in the Sermon on the Mount and in the turning of the other cheek, the very heart of the Christian anarchist argument, if you want, or the, the, the prime evidence, if you will. And so Paul's talking about love and sacrifice, about overcoming evil will good. And you see a progression of love and sacrifice being advocated from for friends first, then to strangers, then to enemies, and then comes the Romans 13, as in that's where the state comes in. So there's a progression, kind of an ever-widening circle of people to consider in a sense, or yeah, actors to consider, friends, strangers, enemies, and then comes the state. So it might be a case, therefore, of loving your enemies and respecting authorities out of love and care and forgiveness and turning the other cheek. Not exactly the same mental setup, should we say, as kind of reverence for the state and stand up for the flag and hand on heart, etc. So it seems to be more of a test case, an example of turning the other cheek. It's an example of Paul interpreting the passage of the Sermon on the Mount rather than a betrayal of it. Furthermore, we have the English version, which itself is translated from the Greek, which probably isn't exactly the language that Jesus used, but but let's go with the text that we have. To be subject to doesn't exactly mean to swear allegiance to or to blindly obey. Uh, It's a particular turn of phrase and, and not another, and that's worth perhaps bearing in mind. The powers are ordained by God, but that's because ever since the book of Samuel, we know that the human beings God was talking to, the Australites at the time, decided that they wanted to be like other nations and have political rulers. And up until then, they only have judges. They're appointed for particular purposes, limited purposes, limited times. Samuel goes to God and says, this is what they want. God says, that's not a good idea. You can warn them that all of this will follow, but if they insist, I will grant their wish. And so he goes back, they insist, he grants the wish. In other words, the powers are ordained by God, but not as his first best preference, but as a kind of second best Almost like a plan B. Uh, Yeah, with with a community that's not listening to him, which is kind of the story of the Bible. Um, So there's that. There's also... Perhaps in this text, the notion that perhaps Christians should not fear authorities despite doing what they know is good. And it's worth noting that Paul himself doesn't exactly obey the authorities that prosecute him or pursue him, try and chase him all the time. So it doesn't seem plausible that he would be counseling, authority says this, therefore you do that. So the notion that rulers are not a terror to good works might be also hinting at the idea that good works are good. You just do the good works because they're good. You shouldn't 
fear, I suppose, the authorities as a result of that. Jesus doesn't fear the authorities right up until, again, his very crucifixion. They crucify him. They kill him. He doesn't approach that with fear. So all in all, you look at these, these passages and it, you know, it seems that Paul is telling Christians in Rome not to rise up in arms against the authorities that are beginning to persecute them, but to kind of set up an example of humility, of turning the other cheek, of love and forgiveness. So just to well, clarify, just to yeah. clarify, in concrete terms, this looks more like if people were coming to arrest Christ and crucify him, the job of Peter, who cuts off uh, the ear of one of the, the guards who are coming to take Christ, Jesus, if I'm not mistaken, tells Peter, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword, heals mm -hmm. the guy's ear, the guy goes on his way, and they take Christ. Let's himself uh, be arrested. In, in a, let's say, modern day example, would this look something like you are preaching good works, you're preaching peace, you're preaching a change to the system that is, or a change to the world. The cops show up at your door, they seek to arrest you, and you let them arrest you? I suppose it does. I mean, that, that, that is what seems to follow. Now, why do they arrest you? Because they probably feel that whatever you have been doing has been problematic, subversive. I mean, it is, it's not unlike, again, the, way, the forms of activism of quite a few proponents and activists of sort of nonviolence. You know, you can think of Martin Luther King, Gandhi, and every example that's followed since, and there's more and more of people submitting to their arrest, using the trial, if necessary, as an outlet to preach their position and defend their views. But yeah, not resist violently those authorities when they come. And indeed, yes, Jesus does subject himself to the political powers. He accepts his arrest, his trial, and his crucifixion. It does sound awkward. It, it seems surprising and counterintuitive to many activists. Of course it does. Certainly won't deny that it does. But that does seem to be, first of all, what Jesus is preaching. It, what Paul is saying seems to be compatible with that. And, as I've been saying, it also, you know, is similar to the core logic that a lot of nonviolent activists have subscribed to. It. And the point is that that does lead to change. It does transform, at least gradually, or that's the, the wider social and political community. It doesn't leave them unaffected. Can I just say, I suppose, so the, the only other passage that's usually thrown back at Christian anarchists is, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And people usually forgot and to, forget unto God what is God's. And here the Christian anarchist line is to say, well, first of all, okay, you can look at the concrete moment when he says that um, the Pharisees are out to trap him. The text is pretty clear about them. They, they pose the question. He first says, well, bring, because they ask him, should we pay taxes or should we not pay taxes? Eventually, that's the crunch question. He asks them, bring me a coin that I may see, I think, I can't remember the exact word. Now, he doesn't therefore have a coin. They have a coin. They flip out the coin. He says, whose face is it on there? They say Caesar's. That's when he says, give to Caesar's what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. In the Roman world, what your face is on belongs to you. Coins belong to Caesar. They still do today. I mean, in England, you've got the queen's face on banknotes and you certainly will face trouble if you burn them, right? They belong to the queen. So Jacques Ellul is good on this. He therefore argues the question becomes, what is Caesar's and what is God's? And to the community that Jesus preaches, the answer is pretty clear. What is Caesar's? Coins, maybe public monuments, a few other things. But what is God's is life, is basically everything else. And so when Jesus says, to render to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God, he's not saying, therefore, obey political authorities all the time. In a, in a way, he's saying something similar to what we've just been elaborating, which is actually the priority is God's will. If the authorities ask of you certain things that it is easy enough to comply with without contradicting what God wants from you, do it. They want to collect taxes? It's their money anyway. Should you really have all that much money? But you know, give it. But focus on giving to God what is God's. That's the important bit as well. And so both of these passages turn out, as I see it, I challenge people to convince me otherwise, I suppose, to be rather compatible with the Christian anarchist interpretation rather than contradictions of it. And those are the only two passages that can be thrown at Christian anarchists uh, to say, ah, but you, know, you must be mistaken. Surely it's about obeying authorities. And as a little snidey sort of conclusive bracket, 
the interesting challenge for those who think that these passages are passages that justify the legitimacy of political authorities, the challenge for those people is to tell me how you then differentiate between perfect democracies and perfect authoritarian or fascist regimes, because there isn't a really a discrepancy. So you obey these, but not those. I mean, that doesn't follow from that, but that's a, a different kind of worms and a rather a, a provocative way to close, I suppose. Speaking of violence, some of our current political discourses around suggesting that violence can be in the form of words, that words can hurt or harm just as much, sometimes even more, as physical violence. What is the Christian anarchist's perspective on words as violence, language as a weapon? I guess it's a good moment to say that although I've written about Christian anarchists and I try and summarize what I call the Christian anarchist view is in the book, I don't know if I qualify as one, and I don't necessarily mean to put words into Christian anarchist, and I know that some don't necessarily like even that expression, Christian anarchist, but there is, I think, a pretty coherent, uh, mutually reinforcing group of advocates and activists that you might call kind of Christian anarchist. Now, the reason I say that is because then who do you look at? Tolstoy doesn't really talk about violence of language. It's not really something that's been articulated at the time that he writes. More recently, that is certainly an important way of analyzing the world and yet yeah, the violence of language in all sorts of different ways. And a lot of Christian anarchists today that I know of would subscribe to the view that there is a violence in language, that language isn't anodyne. But let's be clear, that's not exactly the same violence as physical violence, like hurting other human beings, risking drawing blood. Just as to bring that other example, which is important as well, People talk about structural violence or systemic violence. I'm not here to judge whether that's the right thing or not, but as one author I've been reading recently kind of argues compellingly enough, I suppose, they're not the same thing. There might be violence that is systemic, economic, you know, forms of, I suppose, modern slavery, etc. But it's not necessarily the same violence as the kind of physical violence of being beaten in the street by state authorities, all the violence of terrorism, that is, again, the violence against human bodies. It might be that systemic violence relies on it, and ultimately that systemic violence relies on the threat of physical violence, but then they are conceptually different things. Similarly, I think, with the, language, the violence of language. It's not necessarily exactly the same thing, but I don't know of any Christian anarchist today that wouldn't at least be open to thinking about the violence of language, the violence of the system, in particular that maybe, but the violence of language as well, when thinking about you know, what's wrong about violence in general, physical in particular, but other forms too. So I think that extrapolation is there to be made. And a lot of those Christian anarchists who have been alive and active since that has been articulated are just as willing as any other, I suppose, left-wing radical to think along those lines, if that makes sense. There's a sense in Christianity, I believe Christ says, thou shalt not whisper rock, or like even whisper or think in, in one's head a, an insult. Right, that you're supposed to be of a, of a pure mind and a pure conscience. And this includes the, the purging of malicious thoughts. And it's definitely something that's harder to do, right? But my, yes. And it starts out with the self. But my question for you is this, this author you're reading, do you mind letting us know at least just after or, or now who that is? So that we may cite it in the interview. Yes, Andrew Fiala, um, Nonviolence, A Quick Immersion. I can, I can send you the reference introduction pretty thorough actually to nonviolence. absolutely i can send you that uh, the the broader point you made just before a, a christian anarchists aren't the only christians to uh, point out that what a lot of jesus's ethics seems to be about is going beyond if you want the act uphill in a sense at, towards the origin of it so whether it's with adultery or with violence or with not swearing or you know, love of enemies a lot of what he pushes in in the Sermon on the Mount, seems to be trying to go back to the intention before the act. And therefore, yes, the perfect way of trying to live out that kind of ethics or the, the, the intention, the goal is to try and, I suppose, purge your mind of malicious thoughts, never mind the actual enacting uh, or, or acting upon them. So, yes, but that's not just a Christian anarchist position. More conventional Christian thinkers would say similarly about what Jesus does to the Old Testament ethics. To, to bring it back to Tolstoy, uh, yeah. in The Kingdom of God is Within You, he writes how uh, if both the 
conservative elements of his society justify violence by and the revolutionary elements of society justify violence. The conservatives arguing that they need to use violence to destroy and count any revolutionary uh, forces in the society, and the revolutionaries arguing that they need violence to destroy any conservative forces in society. Uh, to Tolstoy, he believed that violence would sort of spill over into the utopia either sought to create and sort of damn that utopia before it began, or before it began. Do you believe that, inter I know you focus also on international politics, do you think that this is the case, that we see Tolstoy's words reflected on the, the world stage, that utopias achieved through violence reach violence? In short, probably yes, uh, but it's a big question and we're talking about sweeping generalizations here, so I suppose we need to be careful. Yeah, that's a preface worth kind of bearing in mind. I think one of the things that drew me to Tolstoy from the start, even if I didn't necessarily agree entirely with every step of his analysis or the kind of categorical nature with which he states whatever he states, he seems to be onto something when he worries about the way in which violence seems to be contagious, the way in which when, when violence begins to be used in, say, revolution or in counter-revolution, it takes hold. It leads to retribution, imitation. It embitters the actor of it, the, the enactor of it, as well as the recipients. So it brutalizes the person doing it. Because the, the more you employ violence, the easier it is to keep employing it. Yes, you look at uh, quite a lot of violent revolutions and those that don't succeed end up in a bloodbath of some proportion at least. Uh, you know, and those who tried it you know, end up dead, injured, imprisoned, whatever, with all forms of violence inflicted upon them, never mind the violence that they've inflicted elsewhere. Those violent revolutions that succeed, you know, often end up with rather oppressive regimes, with all sorts of violent excesses, because you take control with violence, you kind of inevitably will always be wary of everyone around you who might be likely to do that to you in order for them to take control. Etc. So I think to point to one thing that Tolstoy argues, the one thing that getting others to agree to what you want to do through violence does, the one thing that does is it teaches others that violence seems to be a way of forcing others to do what you want. It doesn't necessarily teach or encourage the kind of moral behavior you wanted in the first place. So when you impose equality by violence, you show others who are looking at this or people further down the centuries that violence is a way of imposing a particular way of life. You don't necessarily encourage, again, people around then or people later on to embrace that kind of the morality of the ethics of equality of themselves. Again, it, and that's why for Tulsa it's about trying to encourage that inside out and by example. But it's a broad generalization and there may be examples of revolutions where some violence was involved that didn't necessarily degenerate into a complete bloodbath. It's also true that some revolutions that have been achieved, I suppose, non-violently haven't necessarily involved no violence, no suffering at all, although usually it's violence that is willingly accepted by the, should we call them revolutionary, as a form of exemplary suffering that hopefully will convert others. And I mean, here, I think that the work of Erika Chenoweth and Maria Stefan, rather seminal study, I mean, very famous work by now, widely discussed, published in 2011, is, is an interesting study that tends to back that up. So they look at the last hundred or so years of revolutions, violent and non-violent. They code them, they put that through various statistics, and the result is quite unequivocal. And it is that although both violent and non-violent revolutionary attempts fail more often than they succeed, violent ones fail more often than non-violent ones. And non-violent revolutions are much more likely to generate stabler, more democratic, more inclusive forms of government and governance than violent forms of revolution. In other words, as a really in, in broad strokes anyway, in term, and we are generalizing, that evidence seems to back up, if you want, the hunch that Tolstoy was on to. But that's a brief answer to a broad question. You mentioned maybe a few minutes back about the viral notion, the viral nature of violence, that it sparks more, it begets more. What about nonviolence? Is nonviolence similarly contagious? Is it more fragile? 
um, again, good question. Violence embitters quite quickly. There's all sorts of risks with violence. You inflict violence on someone, first of all, you might have been mistaken. That person may not be that guilty, may not be the guilty one. That person has relatives who will be embittered, who will seek retribution. Violence, therefore, you know, em embitters and justifies itself. If you use violence to try and achieve better means, then you can't tell others that they can't use violence to achieve means that they think are better, much harder to sort of do that. So the way in which violence is stages is kind of as I've described, and, but, but it might be slightly different to the way in which nonviolence is contagious. The way nonviolence is contagious, the way Tolstoy kind of imagines it, the way people like Gandhi and, and many since operationalize it, I suppose comes more out of I do like this impression, kind of moving people's hearts, making them rethink their assumptions about which side holds the moral high ground, making people want to agree not only with what you preach or the point you're trying to make, but also deeply respect the way in which you do it. Does that mean that it's easy for others to kind of contagiously embrace those methods? Not necessarily, because it takes courage to put your body on the line and to resist the urge to retaliate when you're being persecuted in the, you know, yeah, in the streets or you know, clobbered by an authoritarian regime. It's by inspiration, I suppose, that nonviolence hopes to be contagious, as opposed to by retribution, which is in a sense more knee-jerk. But yes, the claim, I guess, uh, implicit or explicit, that Christian anarchists make and other thinkers and activists of sort of pacifism and nonviolence is that both are contagious. The cycle of violence and if you want the cycle of, should we call it love and forgiveness or generosity. But they work in slightly different ways, but the hope is that the virtuous cycle of, should we call it love, can superimpose itself upon the cycle of violence and eventually lead to the replacement of that, yeah, the overcoming of that logic, the, the weakening of the cycle of violence, the spread of a different way of relating to one another. So yes, both contagious, but with slightly different mechanisms in a sense. Is one more contagious than the other? You mentioned that violence has a knee-jerk reaction, whereas the other requires internal reflection and time and is not, in some sense, doesn't come as easily to us. It's difficult because part of me does not want to answer a question that in a sense is purely quantitative. But I know that's not what you mean, but I, I don't know how you compare the two. And part of the difficulty is these things don't happen without broader context that matter. The argument that a lot of the kind of thinkers that I'm, I have in mind, I suppose, seem to themselves have in mind, is that in a sense we've reached a moment in humanity where we are. Empathy makes possible perhaps an increasing contagiousness of the cycle of nonviolence. As human societies have become more and more complex, as perhaps we can relate to one another even further away than before, we know a lot more about all sorts of forms of oppression and injustice perhaps than before, that it is, that if you want the ingredients are there for nonviolence to spread more than perhaps it ever was, and that perhaps we've reached a level of consciousness for those who have a kind of progressive view of history that wasn't there before. So in that sense, it might be that Nonviolence, to call it, that is increasingly contagious now that we've reached a historical moment, if you want, where that is more contagious than it might have been before. Whereas the kind of retaliatory logic of violence has been there for much, much longer, but is often less reflective, less thoughtful, certainly less creative. It's pretty easy. Is that the right word? Anyway, let's stick with it to, to sort of retaliate violently when being attacked. It doesn't show much creativity. The way of nonviolence precisely one of the reasons that I'm so interested in it, I guess, and, and many others, is that it takes much more creativity, but human collectives and activists can be incredibly creative in that regard. I think it's Gene Sharp who lists many years back 198 methods of nonviolence, and people have added more to them. There's lots of different ways of pursuing something nonviolent, whereas violently, I mean, ultimately, you're talking about physical violence. I suppose you could vary your gun, etc. But you know, we're, we're talking about something that's fundamentally similar in its logic. Nonviolence is much more creative, in a sense, slower too, I guess. But it might be something that is increasingly possible, perhaps because we've reached a historical juncture, but perhaps also because we have an increasing body of examples from the last century. A unique feature of this modern world has been sort of the rise in power of the UN, <clears throat> recognizing that is a soft power. In a previous talk, 
you had mentioned that it wasn't so much the existence of a super state uh, that could coerce actors into not being violent, but rather the readiness to do violence that would lead to violence. If we, instead of surrendering power to a super state that coerces actors to not be violent, that Tolstoy preferred having the readiness to do violence brought down in order to guarantee peace. Why, why is that the case? Why wouldn't the surrendering of our power to a sort of larger superordinate sovereign solve the violence problem? Have it. <laughs> um, so firstly, uh, I'm reminded of Ian Atak's piece on this, which for, he kind of compares the Kantian solution for peace to the Tolstoyan one. Kant's solution being, you know, we reach perpetual peace through particular institutional structures that protect it or that embed it. Tolstoy thinks that that is foolish. It's not going to work for all sorts of reasons, which I'll develop in a second. And he prefers instead, he, in fact, he thinks the only way to it, it's not that it's necessarily easy, but it's for the refusal of violence to be something that's embraced by an increasing number of human beings through the example of others, again, inside out and onwards. Doesn't mean it's easy, but the other solution has, you know, the setting up of institutional structures might have apparent easiness to it. It doesn't necessarily lead to results. One of the, there's lots of problems with the UN approach. It doesn't mean it's, it's entirely ineffective, of course, but among the problems by design, which people predicted, uh, including Tolstoy, first of all, who guards the guardians? So you want a system that prevents lots of actors from committing violence against one another, but you argue that in order to have that, you need a sort of superpower above that that acts as the kind of the police for that, that holds, therefore, the power to inflict violence on anyone who breaches the logic and inflicts violence on others. Well, how do you know that the people in control of that are necessarily better people, less likely to be violent, or are driven by, to put it more nuanced, by suppose, economic and other interests that are more likely to prevent them from abusing others? You know, the problem, one of the fundamental arguments, I guess, for a lot of anarchists is one of the issues with the state is you create a pyramidal structure, allegedly to prevent all sorts of human beings from committing evil against one another, but there's very little way of preventing the worst in humanity from taking control of that pyramidal structure and inflicting all sorts of evil on such a much bigger scale on lots of others too. So one of the problems with the UN is that. Another is the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. That is the council that arbitrates when peace and security have been threatened and legitimize intervention. Those five permanent members are five of the top six arms exporters. They are nuclear powers. They use the power that the UN allows them to, to meet and that they calculate are to their advantage. And they might therefore be able to use the UN as a kind of cloak of legitimization, of legitimacy when intervening in particular ways. That doesn't mean that those actions were actually all that altruistic. They might use the language of peace and altruism and philanthropy and democracy and responsibility to protect and whatever else. But in reality, you look at the history of their interventions and they seem to fall rather short and be rather selective. So there's lots of problems with the UN and we have tried it. It might be better than what preceded it, but it hasn't exactly resolved what it purported to resolve. The Tolstoyan solution might not be straightforward, might not come immediately, maybe unrealistic, I don't know. I ask it, I'm just interested in thinking about it because I'm worried about violence. But the Tolstoyan argument, the Tolstoyan solution is to look at, at something else, which is more, I suppose, ethical and inside out cause of violence rather than just the structures of international institutions. In, in what way? Do you mind making that a little bit more concrete, the Tolstoyan solution, to say something like the UN, the sort of, if you would, greatest soft power hegemon, maybe second only to the European Union. Okay, in what way does the UN have soft power? You want me to talk about Tulsa rather than the UN. Uh, or the maybe UN hold, in the sense of hard power, they do have soldiers I mean, exactly. that they deploy the on UN, peacekeeping missions as right. well. So right, so exactly. The UN, okay, the UN doesn't have soldiers that are, strictly speaking, UN soldiers. They are soldiers that member states of the UN sent to the UN, they wear a, a blue helmet and they do things that the UN has asked it to do. But what, so the UN holds soft power, but a lot of the soft power that the UN holds 
is in the area of the, the General Assembly and lots of the organs of the UN, UNICEF and whatever else. These are organs of state of soft power because they are bodies through which voices from across the world can coordinate efforts without necessarily using violence to achieve particular aims. That's different from the UN Security Council, which is the body, you know, 15 members, five of them are permanent, they're the only ones who hold veto. And that's the one body that technically decides when a war is legitimate, is morally accepted acts of an approximation of use ad bellum, which is one of the two strands of just war theory. I mean, it's the institutionalization of it. That, that's not exactly soft power. I mean, it's as soft power as the state. I mean, there's the threat of violence. If you don't comply, Saddam, you will know what we mean by all necessary means. You know, this isn't exactly soft power of the kind of UNICEF kind. That's one thing. It may well be that at the very least, let's be fair to it, I suppose, institutions like the UN and the EU in allowing lots of different parts of the world, should we call them that, to interact, to develop forms of interdependence with each other, the EU in particular, perhaps with significant degrees of economic integration. It might be that that does help minimize the threats of an escalation to war. It's, I'm not going to argue that they're entirely ineffective. Tolstoy's argument is to say none of that really gets to the root cause. And for Tolstoy, it comes down to you don't want violence, don't do violence yourself. Therefore, stop participating in institutions and roles that inflict violence against other human beings. So don't be a policeman, don't be a judge, don't be a soldier in particular, refuse to be enlisted for military conscription, even when you're supposed to be obliged to. Refuse to give your, I suppose, moral consent to those institutions in the first place. That's kind of the path of Tolstoy. Now, it's, of course, difficult to imagine how that resolves violence, unless you follow Tolstoy in the logic that that spreads contagiously. It inspires others to do the same. It leads to a gradual moral transformation that ripples out from the initial examples to gradually, hopefully soon enough, the rest of humanity. Is that likely? I don't know. Is it likely to be quick? I doubt it. But is it necessarily less likely than the UN option to, uh, to deliver the, the intended fruits? I, I don't know. It might be that that is the only, you know, the, uh, ultimately a more secure, a more likely way in the long run, because the role of the UN hasn't exactly prevented all sorts of violence, uh, and indeed sort of rather unjust violence in the, you know, to the advantage of particular socioeconomic interests. <laughs> I'm curious what Tolstoy would say about this global mutual vulnerability that countries have via mutually assured destruction in many cases. What, what would Tolstoy say about this? I, so here, I think we have to try and extrapolate from Tolstoy's thinking and imagine what he would say. So inevitably, it could be unfair or people might want to argue otherwise. He doesn't use the word of the language of mutual vulnerability, but I like it. Before I talk about, um, what's the example you mentioned? Uh, yeah, mutually assured destruction. If you want your neighbor to stop feeling threatening to you if you you know if you're worried as a country the people around you who are threatening you can take the traditional option boost up your defenses you'll claim their defenses the problem is by improving your military arsenal those neighbors are likely to feel threatened they're likely to themselves do the same thing it's the classic sort of dilemma I forget the name for it uh, in, in political arms race yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, arms race is another way of putting it, absolutely, but there's, there's another term. But, but yes, it creates, let's say, at least a, a race to kind of elusive security. You're never going to get to that stage. Your neighbors will never allow you to get to the stage where you have so much more power over them that they can't be threatening to you. So you get in that logic of mutual insecurity that kind of follows from it. And that's arguably a narrative you can apply to much of the history, certainly the recent history of modern international relations. I mean, that's one way you can try and secure your country's sort of national security, I guess. Another is to accept that you are never going to achieve that sort of moment where you know for sure that you can't be invaded, you're the one that has all the power, you know, much more power than your neighbors. You kind of accept, therefore, that you are vulnerable, and maybe by that example, your neighbors will accept that they might be vulnerable too, and out of that, the whole neighborhood, to extend the analogy, kind of moves to try and collaborate and build some predictability, some trust, some interconnections, some trade and exchange of ideas, etc. 
but out of an acceptance of mutual vulnerability rather than a desire to somehow achieve that sense of security, which is always elusive, by holding more power than the neighbors. Tolstoy doesn't use that kind of vocabulary, but certainly he does comment a bit, I mean, in passing at least, uh, about what we might call the arms race logic. Right? But in the kingdom of God, he definitely, he definitely has passages about, I believe, the peace conferences of his day and the budgets, the sheer quantity of wealth devoted to those arms races. Yes, it I seemed... mean, the, in fact, he, he makes several different commentaries on this. I mean, he compares different states, you know, racing to have the bigger weapon as two drunkards fighting, uh, I think, and talk about, I'll pinch you, I'll pinch you, I'll bludgeon you, but I'll bludgeon you, etc. I mean, there's, there's a passage, I think, in the kingdom of God along those lines. So that's specifically, in a sense, to, I think what I was commenting about here. But he also critical of, peace conferences, as well as slightly different topic, military alliances ostensibly for peace. So he witnessed in his days, you know, an alliance between Russia and France, which apparently was trumpeted and sold at the time as a purely peace-loving agreement in case Germany becomes threatening. Everybody knew already then that it was a military alliance against Germany, again, not just against the resurgent Germany, not just a defensive alliance, but it was it intended. And we could see why in the logic of both of these nation states, why they would think that Germany is a threat and they would ally against it. So uh, he's critical of that. And yes, he's critical of peace conferences. And I mean, there's some brilliant passages where he, you know, I suppose he uses a satirical tone to describe how you know, some nations apparently sort of just now discovered a mutual love for one another and they're now going to pursue these things, you know, non-violent, peaceful, etc. We can see through it. We, everyone can see through it at that time. In continuation, you've, I know in the past you've mentioned uh, Greece and Turkey's earthquake diplomacy. Do you mind just explaining briefly what is earthquake diplomacy and how does this reflect the political mutualism that you've written about? It's, um, in, in fairness, I mean, it's not my expression. It's a word that was used by the commentariat, if that's a term, at the time. So we're talking early 2000s when uh, first Istanbul was struck by a particularly strong earthquake. Uh, yet at the time, the relations between Greece and Turkey were rather tense. These things can have ebb and flow, but they have been very tense at times. And, and despite that, Greece sent aid, specialists, medical help, etc., in Istanbul, and it was welcome, and it was a, a notable moment, I suppose, in diplomatic relations. And then, is it a year or two later, an earthquake hit Athens? It wasn't as strong an earthquake, but it was a significant one nonetheless. And this time, Turkey sent some help. And so, that, at the time, that was described as earthquake diplomacy because out of that came a slightly improved period in diplomatic relations between those two states and certainly being at war with each other in, in, in their recent history. And I think I use that term because, first of all, we were nearer to them than we are now. And I think it was in Greece that I used it. I don't necessarily ascribe to this isn't central too much as it's more an example of how relationships of trust can be built despite starting point of mutual distrust. And sometimes there are opportunities in particular, when a particular those constituency of humanity suffers from a particular calamity, such as an earthquake, these give human beings, let's call them or human collectives, opportunities to sort of reach out and develop a form of, first of all, exchange. It means that, you know, Greek were there and were being helpful in Turkey, and some of the Turks there, and similarly the way around, will have therefore come across people who were often demonized in their textbooks, in the media, etc. And yet these people are there and helping. And so it can lead to a gradual shift of perspective. And I guess this is an entirely different to the logic of European integration, whereby, you know, post-war trust was built between, you know, nations that have been at war with each other for quite a while and sometimes rather brutally. I think that's the main, I don't think it's central to Christian anarchism. It was more an example of the way in which there, there, there are opportunities worth taking to build trust and trusting relationships. Given the great vulnerability you, you expose when you're a pacifist, that violence may be inflicted upon you. What's, and also given how we're built, that our motivational structures, is it possible that we can be a true non-pacifist without a belief in something like an afterlife? A true pacifist, a true, a true non-violent activist, you mean? You said a non-pacifist. Yeah, 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 yes. I mean, again, good question. There are arguments that Christian anarchists, for example, hold because they see it as what the Christian call is, and which isn't, of course, going to be something that necessarily has much purchase with non-Christians. But I think the argument often holds nevertheless. If one easy answer 
is why would you stick to nonviolent methods if you're not necessarily a Christian? Because they're more effective. And that's what Chenoweth and uh, Stefan show, uh, as well as they're not the only ones, there are other studies that go in that direction, but they're the more famous ones. Uh, they are you know, empirically more effective. So there are, there are a range of people who have subscribed to nonviolent tactics in seeking change, not because of some moral preference for pacifism or a, a necessary commitment not to be violent, as in not necessarily for moral deontological reasons, the decision that violence is always wrong, but because pragmatically it seems to be more effective. There are other arguments that you know, it, it is more recoverable if you're wrong, right? Violence isn't. Once the violence is inflicted, you can't undo that. There, there's blood on the floor and wounds and suffering when you act non-violently. If you misjudged your analysis, at least there isn't all that pain and suffering that carries on. And, you know, also because the moral arguments for some sort of deontological ones that you might prefer the path of nonviolence because violence is bad. If you want to be too simplistic, it's problematic. It hurts. And you might reject the way of uh, violence simply on those kind of moral grounds. So there's a lot, you know, moral, pragmatic, and other reasons why you certainly don't need to be a Christian to sort of follow that path. And that's why there's lots of examples of non-Christians who've done so, and lots of examples from lots of different traditions as well who, who uh, embraced, should we call it, the way of non-violence. Just to press on that a, a little, um, recognizing that there are other traditions that act non-violently and even sacrifice their life for non-violent resistance, one that comes to mind are the Buddhists in Vietnam who lit themselves on fire in protest of the violence of the Vietnam War uh, there's still a sense that there's this belief in an afterlife, whether that be in a, you know, another plane or the belief that you will live on in some way and that this living on is more important than the material flesh that's being burnt away, that's being nailed to the cross, that's what have you. When we talk about the pragmatism of nonviolence, I would agree that it would be more pragmatic but would it be more pragmatic to the person in the moment who was going to be nailed to the cross or who was going to be lit ablaze? We talk about the violence on the floor, the blood on the floor, violent yeah, revolutions. But when the policeman knocks on your door and you know, starts taking a, a shot at you for disobeying the state, there's a sense that there will be blood on the floor there as well and that this would have to be justified. Your blood, yes. Right. Can Exactly. So... I guess what we're, we're trying to say is, can't recognizing this, can someone who doesn't believe in the afterlife, in the resurrection, in moksha, nirvana, what have you, truly be a pacifist? There are quite a few examples of that. Brief caveat, there's a huge debate in the scholars on pacifism and nonviolence about the distinction between the two. And there are people who insist on using slightly separate terms because uh, those who prefer nonviolence, and there are many, think that the word pacifism tends to come with a kind of connotations of kind of complete rejection of, sort of principled rejection of violence, whereas it's, uh, those who focus on nonviolence are more, I suppose, interested in the methodology and whether it's effective. So that it's a distinction kind of in my mind when we talk about this. There are lots of examples of activists chose the, the path of nonviolence without necessarily doing so only because they thought there would be some sort of reward. Let's put it differently. Soldiers enlist, those who would choose to enlist, enlist with, with the knowledge that they might be shot at, they might die. Okay. It doesn't take a religious position to understand that a path you take can lead to you having to face significant suffering or the ultimate price. It depends how committed you are to that cause, I suppose, and yes, to the method that you're pursuing. A lot of the uh, nonviolent activists who have stood unmoved when being shot at or have violence faced against them have, I guess, convinced themselves over the year that the cause is a just one, that few things are achieved without some people suffering, the question is one of calculation. You know, you can take the path of violence, but it might lead to more blood overall than the path of nonviolence. Again, not a costless path. And yes, it's all the more, I suppose, enraging or difficult to possibly stomach when, you know, among the few victims, there'll be you. You're being shot at at that moment. But by then, that activist has convinced, convinced themselves that that is the better path. There might be all sorts of other reasons. Some people might have been driven to despair, might think there's very little else to live for anyway than, than this ideal and they're still committed to it. 
whether it's the, the guy you know, trying to stop the tank in Tiananmen Square, or also other examples where you think that's kind of suicidal. And there's, there's probably a whole array of reasons, things going on in that person's mind and heart at that moment to do what they do. But there's lots of examples in any case from all sorts of religious and non-religious traditions who, of people who will willingly stand there, uh, yes, and, and have violence be inflicted upon them because they're committed both to the cause and the methodology without it necessarily being a question of reward. We must probably try to resist the temptation as Westerners to think of other religious worldviews as all that comparable to the ones that we're familiar with. In the West, religion is often taken to be mainly about what you believe in and what you have faith in and, and, and a number of propositions that you sort of accept as true or not. That's not necessarily the way a, a lot of Eastern religions in particular, but many others necessarily uh, approach what is religious about them. It's not necessarily a question of proposition. It's not necessarily that you do something simply because you make some sort of rational cost-benefit analysis that you'll get a better deal after death as a result. So the reason why am I saying this? Because what might lead someone from a different religious tradition to nevertheless be on, you know, sort of stick to that path where they're about to suffer might be a slightly different way of approaching things, might be even less calculated, never mind a different calculation to the way we might understand it from a Christian perspective, if you see what I'm saying. So, it, you know, it's complicated, but certainly lots of examples, religious or not, uh, can be found of people who have stood by that path of nonviolence, despite being about to have violence inflicted on them. You're, you're both wanting to rush in. Delineating for the audience who is unclear about the differences between the Eastern religions and the way that we conceptualize it in the West, because when you say that it's not all about beliefs or, or propositions, it's unclear what else it could be about. That's, uh, that takes me uh, gradually outside my comfort zone, but let me try. It, um, we can stay within the realm of nonviolence or pacifism. So what is yeah. it about pacifism or nonviolence that would motivate someone in another religion? In the Christian tradition, as commonly understood today, religion is mostly about belief. Belief in the proposition that there is one God, that Jesus was the Messiah, a, a number of different dogmas, etc. And of course, that's not the only thing about religion, but we kind of approach, are you a believer, uh, is, is the fundamental question. Do you believe in X or Y? So it's kind of propositional in that sense. Turn to, say, for example, Islam. In Islam, there isn't a huge deal of complicated dogmatic theology to subscribe to. The tenet of faith, if you want, of what you believe in is quite short. And, you know, it's about believing that there is but one God and Muhammad is the prophet. It kind of stops there. A lot of what your religiosity is about is enacting in your life as a community and as an individual the pretty extensive array of recommendations about how to live your life. It is in a sense, quite heavily. So it's kind of legalistic and moral. It's, and it's about negotiating how you are to do that today, given that stuff was articulated a while ago and in general terms, and it's about jurisprudence, therefore, etc. Look at Indian traditions. I don't know what's the best term for this, because we, you know, Westerners called it Hinduism when we turned up there. and said, Oh, look, 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 they do this. This looks like this religion. Well, let's call it Hinduism. There wasn't just a thing identified as such prior to Westerners coming up there and giving it that label. But there's lots of different gods involved uh, to, to which you perform a variety of rituals as your day or week or months and years progress. And it's not necessarily about particular tenets of faith as much as it is about particular rituals that you kind of repeat collectively or individually at different points in your life. Again, slightly different. You look at Chinese folk religion and there you start having the role of your own ancestors in semi-divine status that you kind of revere in different corners of the room and whatever else. I'm not saying these things are fundamentally incompatible with one another, but there's slightly different emphases on these different religious traditions. And so in a sense, I guess, in some religious traditions, it's more that out of a particular tradition of doing certain things that I suppose if you acted non-violently, you would act non-violently. It might be in certain Eastern, in certain, uh, Eastern pr perspectives, out of a respect for a, a traditional way of doing certain things that you do, that you stick to pacifism because of religious reasons, not necessarily because you believe in a particular tenet of faith. Does that make at least a bit of sense? I think we can dive into the question of whether or not belief is simply the ideas held in one's head or also the practice. I think that gets really blurred. 
for I guess maybe maybe a, a different time, but to stick to something that we have more familiarity with, let's turn back to Tolstoy. It was known that Tolstoy himself uh, was, if I'm not mistaken, denounced as a heretic by the Orthodox Church for not the Russian Orthodox Church for not believing in the resurrection. He himself advocating the pacifist position, yet being so highly critical of the church and its. Uh, to use his kind of phrases, the miracles and super, what he denounced as superstition. And if I'm not mistaken, he included the resurrection in that category and did not believe it. Yep, is the great, if you would, pacifist or nonviolent thinker that he is. How does, how does Tolstoy reconcile that? Why does he disagree with the resurrection? What's his, what's his beef? Oh, there's lots of different layers to this, but, but let's start here. Um... But first of all, he doesn't see how it's possible. It's not rational. It can't be. Therefore, and, and, and to some extent, he, he, he claims the right to filter every proposition that the church throws at him or religious tradition he's familiar with through the filter of reason. He's not just going to believe in it simply you know, that Jesus flew into the sky just because some people said so or canonized others as having said so many, many years ago. He's going to evaluate all of this. He also looks at the text and he sees very little evidence that Jesus actually predicts his own resurrection and the text that the church looks at he deconstructs and pulls in a different direction he thinks that the church absolutely uses all sorts of dogmas and rituals to distract its flock from what it should be preaching which is jesus's ethics and morality and it does that for all sorts of reasons including that, that ethics and morality is uncomfortable to the establishment and therefore isn't something that the church wants to prioritize but there's no denying that Tolstoy is a very awkward Christian. He's not a traditional Christian. Is he a Christian? Well, that's an open question, which I'll leave you and whoever's listening to decide. If you need to believe that Jesus rose up from the dead and flew into the sky for you to be a Christian, then he's not a Christian. But if Christianity is about Jesus's morality and trying to enact the kind of way of life that Jesus preached and exemplified, then Tolstoy comes closer to being a Christian. He certainly is an uncomfortable Christian for religious authorities. He, did he provoke them? He certainly didn't hesitate to criticize them. He sometimes addresses the clergy. There's a famous appeal to the clergy where he basically tells the clergy, you know you don't believe in all that stuff. We all know you don't. Yeah. So why don't you focus on this instead? Stop, stop pretending. Stop being subservient to this kind of structure called Christianity that you know in your heart isn't actually what Jesus preached. Of course, that got ignored. What got him excommunicated from the Russian Orthodox Church was uh, Resurrection, the book, which it's interesting that he called Resurrection. So this is her, his third most extensive novel. It's not as good as Anna Karenina and War and Peace, partly because it's unfinished. Yet he published it, nevertheless, because he wanted to use the money raised from its sale to help the Duchobors migrate to Canada. Different debate. And it did, by the way, help. Now, it's unfinished, and, it, and the last 20 pages are, you know, he just turns preachy. But if you leave that aside, there's two chapters in that book where Tolstoy describes the performance, you know, as seen by the protagonist of the Eucharist in prison. It's exquisitely painful to the church inevitably. The way he describes it, I mean, he deploys a technique that's been ascribed to him of defamiliarization to ridiculize and take them making the rituals of the church, and of, of all the rituals, the Eucharist, of course, kind of central to the Christian tradition. The political authorities, the censorship at the time, when it allowed the book to be published, the only line from those two chapters that survived was the service began. The rest was edited out. They didn't like it. The church hated it so much and they used that book as the excuse to finally excommunicate also from the Russian Orthodox Church. So that's why it actually happened. But yes, he was as annoying to the religious authorities of his day as perhaps Jesus was to those of his own day. And, and Tolstoy finds an example in, uh, in Jesus for that too. So yes, he was very anti-clerical, very atypical as a Christian, there's no doubt about that, very deistic in his kind of approach to it, very rationalistic. But to those who say, for example, you know, that... that um, should we call it mysticism, dogma, theology, are central to Christianity, thereby seemingly discounting the role of morality, you can flip it round and throw it back at them, because if they claim Tulsa wasn't a Christian, well, you know, isn't morality important as part of Christianity nevertheless? In fact, it is for every religious tradition. Tolstoy might be guilty of discounting 
should we call it dogmatic theology or traditional dogmatic theology, but his opponents, should we call them that, uh, might be guilty of discounting Jesus' morality to a similar extent, if not more. Is there something incompatible with being a patriot and Christian values? But to tack on to that, because you mentioned the Dukabors, can you explain their story as well in, in answering this question from Tolstoy? Dukabors are one of the many that would be called sectarians in the, in the Russian context, sort of, yeah, let's call them radical offshoots of Christianity, radical religious offshoots of the Russian Empire at the time. There are many, but they're, so they're a group originally in the Caucasus and they moved to Siberia and they're being persecuted by the authorities because among the things that they do is they do focus on Jesus' ethics and, it, and from it they also take a refusal to take part in military service. I can't remember what else they do. I think there's an issue around taxes as well, but you know, they're annoying to the authorities. The authorities prosecute them and they come to his attention, I think it's in the mid 1890s, so that's probably about 10, 15 years into you know, his kind of Christian anarchist period after he's kind of turned to Christian anarchism. And at the beginning, he is sold to the idea that they are the example we need. They are precisely people living up to what he's preaching. So he wants to help them. And they are trying to migrate away from persecution in Russia to Canada. Canada is willing to take them, but someone needs to fund the migration. And so he publishes resurrections for the proceeds, for the royalties to fund that move, which they do. Not many years later, though, he comes to distance himself from the Dukhobors because he comes to realize that some of what they stand for is actually quite far removed from what he does. He comes to sort of disagree with the views of their main leader at the time. So it's not, you know, a period of continuous support and kind of mutual love. <laughs> there is certainly a period during which he really likes the Dukhobors, and you can see traces of it in some of his writings published at the time. And he elevates them as one of his favorite examples of Christians today. Uh, it evolves over time. But yes, that does happen around when that novel is published, and it's published in order to fund their migration to Canada. Patriotism. Can you be a Christian and a patriot? Well, lots of Christians today think you can, but Tolstoy wants to tell us that if you look a bit more closely at your New Testament, it seems rather impossible for all sorts of reasons. One is idolatry. I mean, you know, if you're supposed to render to Caesar what is Caesar, but to God, what is God's, God is still the priority. God is the, the one that takes, I suppose, your heart, your passion, the reasons why you do what you do. And certainly you don't kill uh, in the name of a political institution. So I digress. For Tolstoy, the analysis of patriotism hinges on Jesus' counsel to love our enemies. For Tolstoy, it's quite clearly a commentary on a range, not, not only one passage in the Old Testament, but it's a commentary by Jesus on a number of different passages in the Old Testament where God calls his followers to love their neighbors but hate their enemies. Tolstoy thinks that if you look at the text, it's referring specifically to patriots and compatriots and in a sense what Jesus is calling for is for us to love I suppose a broader circle of human beings not just our compatriots but our enemies too now so that's one set of reasons why Tolstoy doesn't have much time for patriotism he also thinks patriotism is a way of stifling the mind it's again allowing certain kind of emotions and pathos to kind of overcome and replace capacity for reason and that can be manipulated by elites he also thinks that a lot of what is justified on the back of patriotism can be justified the way. So for example, he's familiar at the time with arguments you know, in favor of, would it be Irish patriotism, Polish patriotism, Finnish patriotism, should we call it anti-colonial patriotism? So to those who want to tell him, but look, there are people that are oppressed and these, their patriotism is a good patriotism as opposed to the patriotism of the colonizer, the patriotism of the broader empire. Well, Tolstoy's argument is, the liberation of people from their oppression is something that is good because liberation from oppression is what is good, not because those people happen to be Finns or Poles or Irish or whatever else. You don't need patriotism to support the emancipation of people from particular types of oppression. So there's all sorts of reasons why Tolstoy has no time for patriotism and certainly he thinks that patriotism in cases different categories of human being it reinforces differences and enmity, it certainly doesn't promote the kind of widening circle of mutual aid and love that he thinks Christianity is all about. In Putin's Russia right now, we are seeing this 
uh, desire for a multipolar world instead of a unipolar world as espoused by uh, Alexander Dugin. And part of that desire to see a more decentralized multipolar world has been accompanied by the rise of what we call muscular orthodoxy. This has even caused arguably a break between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Greek Orthodox Church, which are no longer in communion. This coming from the controversy surrounding the Ukrainian issue in the church and the politics around Ukraine between the war and, and uh, I believe Donbas. In Russia now we see state-funded Cossack uh, schools for militant youth groups. And we see mil more militarized youth groups like Sorok, uh, Soroko, 40 times 40. What makes this strain of orthodoxy, uh, this muscular orthodoxy, less Christian than the Christian anarchist version of orthodoxy as espoused by Tolstoy? In one or two words, the gospel doesn't seem to be the Christianity that you read about when you read the gospel. It's the Christianity of empire, it's the Christianity of Constantine, it's the Christianity of state church relations. You refer to the politics of it. It's the Christianity of institutions and their politicking. It's got very little to do with turning the other cheek, loving your enemies, forgiving one another, not judging one another. The stuff that Jesus tends to bang on about quite repetitively. It's all unsurprising and further examples, I suppose, of what Christianity has become, of the kind of, we want to call it institutionalized Christianity that Tolstoy is critical of, post-Constantinian, state church, Jewish Christianity, whatever you want to call it. It's a Christianity that is so far removed from uh, the gospel, but as far as, it's not Tulsa, it's Dave Andrews, another Christian anarchist, you know, describes it as almost the Antichrist, although that's a controversial expression, of course. But yes, all that stuff might be convenient for particular political ends. There's all sorts of reasons why the Greek and the Russian Orthodox Church want to be the more important ones and claim to be the more important Orthodox Church, but it's got very little to do with what Jesus preached. Just to continue off of that question, the Russian philosopher Alexander Dugin calls for the return to Byzantine values as part of, its, part of his desire to reshape Russia's role on the world stage. And in Byzantine values, this is understood as the unification of the state and the church in a ruling uh, hegemony and a guiding principle for this new Russia. Did this unification work? in the time of Tolstoy. Why or why not? Depends for whom. Works all right for the establishment, works all right for the church hierarchy, for the state hierarchy. Doesn't necessarily work all that well for the masses or in particular for those who try and actually live by Jesus' ethics. So no, Tolstoy had very little time for those kinds of arguments and thinks they are further examples of how far removed the distortions of Christianity today are from Jesus' ethics. They, they seem to be very unhelpful to the spreading of, I suppose, awareness about Jesus' ethics and, and morality. It, it's Again, I mean, it, it's not that far removed from patriotism and from, I suppose, what you might diagnose patriotism to be. But so no, um, that kind of unification Tolstoy is very critical of because it's, again, further example of the collaboration of state and church authorities, which has placed Christianity, which is, no, and this is the thing that, one of the things that, that makes Tolstoy particularly annoyed is it means that most people associate Christianity with that, and that's precisely what Christianity isn't or shouldn't be as far as Tolstoy is concerned. So it leads to people having a misunderstanding of what Christianity stands for, and that particularly annoys Tolstoy because he would much rather people look at Jesus' ethics, an example. You mentioned in one of your talks, which we'll link to in the description, about the obscene nature of states to spend such a disproportionate amount on defense versus foreign aid. And then later in the talk, you also mentioned that the proper way to change the state is not through political means per se, but through changing oneself first. Well, how, practically speaking, should one change themselves, conduct themselves, someone who's listening, on a daily basis, if they want their country to donate more to foreign aid? Does it involve them giving to the homeless more? 
because I was thinking about this and I realized that even if I was homeless, I could still give to the homeless. There's no end to the amount that I can give. And then in addition to that, you're saying that it would eventually lead to the changing of a state. Well, how does that happen without some law being proposed at some point or some, some senator saying we should change so-and-so? At some point, there does need to, does seem like someone will need to take political action. Just rephrase it, two, two-parter. One, the second part was exactly how does it happen pragmatically without, politi- without political involvement if it's a political situation? And then number one, what is someone supposed to do who's listening to this, who wants to change the policy without changing the policy with changing yeah. themselves? It might sound weird, but I can think of quite a few anarchists I know who have, at the very least, demonstrated or taken some sort of action, sometimes quite militant, to, for example, protect what in the UK is known as the NHS, which is an organ of the state. It sounds paradoxical, but that's because there, are, there may be certain things that I suppose human beings do to one another through the state, or that the state ended up coordinating that aren't as bad as what Black Lives Matter is worried about, for example. Why am I saying this? In 2016, I wrote a piece in uh, The Conversation, which was titled, I think it was my title, but that's what happens with uh, these types of writing, Four Ways to Change the World, um, which sounds grand. But the first thing to note is, as an individual, you, me, we're not going to be another Gandhi or a Jesus. It's unlikely. Single-handedly, we're not going to necessarily get the state to care for the homeless or get proper care for the homeless on our own. That's, that doesn't mean we can't try, but doesn't mean therefore that we just drop it all and say, I ah, sod it, I'll just carry on doing something else and not worrying about society. I think there are therefore at least four ways in which we make decisions every day that we can be a bit more conscious of and try and calibrate towards the kinds of things that we worry about in life. As a producer, as a consumer, as a political actor, and in the micro politics of every day. As a producer, uh, we all, uh, or most of us, end up you know, working for a living, offering our productive capacity for decades in our life to a particular organization with particular aims, or maybe several over time. This isn't something that we all have a lot of choice in. And uh, from a Tolstoy perspective, the gaze is much more severe the higher up the social hierarchy you are because you have more choice. If the choice for you is misery and unemployment or working for a company that happens to sell arms so that at least you can feed your kids, it's not as dramatic or as kind of uh, unforgivable, I suppose, the choice as it is if you are a, you know, a top graduate from a top university and you choose to work for, I don't know, the marketing department of uh, an arms company as opposed to, I don't know, Oxfam or whatever else. Not everyone has the same degree of choice and therefore the kind of the severity of Tolstoy's gaze, if you want, increases the higher up the hierarchy. But we do make choices. Many of us have some degree of choice over time, at least, about our, what we produce in economic terms. As consumers, without going too cheesy and predictable, you know, you can choose to buy... Um, products that are, I don't know, uh, slavery-free, fair trade, organic. There's all sorts of labels that exist now to cater for such consumers. Or you can choose to ignore that. Am I a perfect consumer? Is any of this, by the way, perfect, uh, um, possible kind of imperfection? Possibly not. We're talking over you know, Zoom at the moment. It's a particular company. We're using electricity, which where I am in France is produced from nuclear power. And none of that's perfect, but we can still make choices to some degree in the way we spend the money that we do have. And so again, there, we can choose to sort of be attentive to certain possibilities or ignore them. As political actors in democracy, it's not just about voting every four or five years, which is one thing we can do. And that doesn't mean that whoever we vote for, we absolutely love, by the way. It might be that the other guy, and it's usually a guy, is much, much worse. So it might be better to still vote. Um, And yes, I'm saying this this year. There's also everything else we uh, can do in terms of write petitions, write to your MPs. These things aren't always pointless, participate in demonstrations, join trade unions, join particular organizations. There's all sorts of 
political activity you can take part in. And finally, in the micro encounters of everyday life, when you're queuing at a supermarket and someone says something frankly outrageous to someone else, something racist or sexist, or when, I don't know, a problematic uncle says something that they shouldn't really at the sort of Christmas table or Thanksgiving or whatever is your thing. You can choose to sort of let go or to confront. Now, confrontation isn't always helpful if it's militant and aggressive. There are methods to this, but you can, again, choose to ignore or not. So there are all sorts of ways in which almost on a daily basis, we make decisions on a spectrum. That's not kind of pure black or white kind of thing, but where we can try and calibrate those decisions with the things that we care about the most. Now, the other thing I think, so that's in terms of what an individual can do, I suppose. The other thing I, I suppose I want to say, I guess, is if you take, for example, an anarchist view that, so I've often found myself uh, batting for anarchism in ah, friendly but um, not a, you know, environments that, that, are, you know, that, that don't necessarily agree with the logic. So that you know, people push you, what about this, what about that? And there's often a moment in the conversation where, when people will say, well, all right, but you know, setting up alternative communities is obviously you know, utopian or unrealistic. And I usually like to stress that it's interesting what happens at that moment usually, because often at that point, the interlocutor is kind of close to conceding a lot of the critique that anarchists might make of the system, to call it that, but you know, they are then frustrated by the what to do about it. And one of the things I suppose I, I, I embrace in uh, an anarchist analysis is even if I don't know whether the solution that anarchists put forward is realistic or doable, although I think there's a lot going for it, it's not being tried on a wide enough scale to convince uh, the skeptics, I guess. But that doesn't mean that you can't agree with a lot of the criticism of the existing global political economy that anarchists put forward. So why am I saying that? Because it might be that the how we change the world is really indeed not easy. And as an individual, it's particularly hard on your own to think of ways of doing that. Maybe it needs to be done collectively. But that doesn't mean that we therefore ignore the criticism that has taken us to that position where we think, okay, it needs to change. We can still agree that you know, a lot of this is horrific and unjust and problematic. What we do about it, I'm not necessarily sure. On that note, this is reflected in some of your previous talks. What comes to mind is uh, the following. At the Dialogue of Civilizations Research Institute, you asked the following. Are we really so sure that those people are such selfish, calculating, willful deviants that the full force of the law is now the only option? Could we be the selfish, calculating, and willful ones in our comfortable conformism? This is juxtaposed to trying to understand the other. We refuse to see the link between our behavior and their suffering. Do we co-constitute the system of oppression that we find ourselves in? And in that way, do we get the governments we deserve? There's lots of questions in there. Um, I think part of, one of the things I like about Tulsa, which I think uh, fed uh, this commentary, is his refusal to allow us to shift moral responsibility for acts that we are at least partly contributing to away. He argues that the state is so constituted that it makes that shifting of responsibility easier. So, you know, the, what, whatever violence the state ever inflicts, there's different agents, different cogs in the system that do different bits of it. And every one of these will often find the, the moral responsibility for what they're doing to be somewhere else. Either it's what you were commanded to do, or it's what your role demands, what the demands from society are about your roles or whatever else. But one way or another, it's not your fault that that person suffered even though you were one of the many cogs involved in their suffering. Tolstoy wants us not to kind of manage to kind of pass the buck. Most of us are aware, in fact I, I, I'm trying to think of those people I know who aren't necessarily left-wing to put it that way, most of us are aware that there's plenty of injustice in the world, plenty of suffering, that you know immigrants dying trying to cross the Mediterranean is at least less than ideal, that there's lots of you know economic inequalities and all sorts of problems but most of us also shift or, or try not to think of the responsibility that we have for it. As in, it's not that every single one of us is somehow 100% responsible for all the suffering out there, but in precisely our roles as producers, consumers, in the way we do our policy, etc., we 
contribute to, we consent to particular ways of doing things, we, try, we, we, we turn away, or, or we choose to sort of be aware of them. And therefore, uh, one of the things Tolstoy would, uh, I think, um, mentions, if not explicitly, at least if it's implicit in some of his anal analogies, is you know, the suffering of the starving peasant isn't completely dissociated from the indulgence of the aristocracy. You can't completely disassociate your, the, those things. And, and therefore, yes, it's easy to wish on criminals forceful punishments, uh, calculating punishment on people who are seen to be uh, calculating in deviance. But maybe we, in our conformism, in our rather comfortable surroundings, are the ones who are being calculating in deviance in precisely refusing to see that that person's suffering is intimately tied with the political economy out of which we're doing so well, and for, for perhaps for which perhaps we have some moral responsibility. So I think that's what I was trying to allude to. It's this notion of moral responsibility. And yes, that feeds back to the contributions we do make to society, again, as, uh, to, to use that category as producers, consumers, political actors, and, and in the micro-encounters of every day. So just going off of that, in, in her book, Stalinist Perpetrators on Trial, Lynn Viola, a scholar at the University of Toronto, examines the prosecution of the NKVD middlemen during uh, a Stalinist purge of the purgers. Basically, the Stalinists are trying to get rid of some of these. There's a political maneuver that takes place, and they purge some of the old uh, purgers, and they put these guys on trial. And what she finds is that the modeling of violence from peers and senior officials, as opposed to the direct commands to execute uh, to execute this violence was critical to the adoption of the violence. What does Tolstoy say about the relationship between peace, violence, and modeling? Um, I mean, lots of things, but fundamentally that um, violent people often behave as they have been taught. He's not surprised that uh, the revolutionaries of his day are embracing violent methods because he argues violence is what they have been taught with. They have been shown that violence seems to be a way of getting your way. Violence is the way of the system. It's, it's, you know, they have been often uh, recipients of violence and, and they inflict themselves. So yes, precisely um, that thing in Yola's book, I think, is, is an illustration of that. You use violence to change things, you're going to soon enough be paranoid about the actors around you in case they turn that violence against you and so lo and behold you get the purge of people around you and that kind of logic you find in a lot of dictatorial regimes that took hold after revolution so yes well it also has a lot to say about how uh, peace or love and violence separately can be mimetic and contagious and, and you know model on each other but essentially um, wouldn't be surprised with what you described, violent people or people who have had violence inflicted upon them, uh, inflicting violence themselves. And the more they do that, the more paranoid they are, the more they end up inflicting it on even more people. Of course, the hope from the, um, the peace end of it is that nonviolence can be just as mimetic. And Tolstoy's hope is that what he calls Christian examples, and they're not necessarily Christian in the way we see it, but people basically living by Jesus's ethics, can be mimetic to and overcome, or inspire others and overcome that vicious cycle of violence. Just to wrap up, uh, what may we ask, what are you currently working on and where might our audience find out more about your work? Is there any way that they, those who are interested could help you on your projects? So what am I working on? I'm at the moment working on two things in particular. I'm trying to write a sort of an anarcho-pacifist theory of international relations, although article form, so not that uh, extensive, I suppose, but that's one thing. I'm also working on a pacifist critique of the poppy. Uh, I gather the poppy is a thing in Canada, a bit less so in uh, the US. Uh, it's a thing, at least in Australia to some extent, never really took hold in, in France. But it's particularly the way the poppy is um, used and central to a particular way of thinking about things in the UK, which I'm trying to write a pacifist critique of. So that's one, uh, one thing I'm working on at the moment. Um, uh, publications, I, I try and list all my publications on a Google site, a website I maintain, because many of them are available freely if you know where to look. So I try to put the links there. Not all are. And if, if, if someone wants something that 
uh, that they can't access it, I'm happy for them to contact me and if I can, I'll send them a copy. I'm not precious about um, the intellectual property. I don't really make much from any of these anyway. Um, the articles, you know, they, they, the profits go to um, publishing companies. But in terms of helping, um, I mean, if people like this sort of material, they can help in disseminating and pointing to it and sharing with, with others. I mean, that's one way to help and I am happy um, to be invited for conversations much like we had now too. Um, Thank you, man. I'm happy you were able to make it. I'm, I'm glad we did too. I'm glad we took a bit more time to make sure what we did. I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Alex. We look forward to hopefully speaking with you again. Thank you. Thank you.